Thank you, friends. Well, um, thank you, friends. I, I uh, want to express my appreciation to the local assembly of Nashville for arranging this gathering uh, tonight and also for this beautiful and uplifting program of song and prayer and, and also that too kind um, introduction. Um, probably you know more of those facts. I've forgotten most of them, but, but you remembered them all. So thank you very much. Um, it's, it's always a pleasure to be here. It's been quite a long time uh, since we've been able to come here to Nashville. Of course, this is uh, where, this is Marsha's home. This is where she grew up. And um, our family also lived here for a year or so uh, in the 1980s. Um, before moving back to the National Center at some point. So it's always a feeling of coming home uh, when, when we're able to come back. And um, it's, it's really uh, a privilege to be able to address you at this moment because, you know, this is a very uh, important and unique moment in, in the history of the faith. Um, of course, you're all familiar with the fact that we've uh, completed the first century of the formative age. So 100 years since the passing of Abdu'l Baha and the inauguration of his uh, covenant and, and the establishment of the administrative order through his will. And um, 100 years of effort in um, putting into practice the charter documents he gave us, the divine plan and also his will and testament, one to spread the faith to all parts of the world, the other to raise uh, the administrative order. And uh, so we stand at a vantage point of 100 years where we can look back where we came from and everything that we've went through. And then um, in particular, the last 25 years of that um, hundred years, we have uh, made a significant advance in our ability to carry forward the work of um, the, these two charters in a much more systematic way. When, when the um, Guardian began his efforts, um, the Baha'is uh, barely understood the, the tablets of the divine plan, and only a few individuals had arisen to, to carry out the work. There was no machinery to, to carry it out. So the guardian had to go about teaching us how to build an administration, how to have uh, systematic plans and so on. And all of his efforts were dedicated to that. And in the last 25 years, we were able to build on all of the groundwork that he laid and then the first efforts under the te of the Universal House of Justice to really carry our work forward to a level that really, I think, is unprecedented in Baha'i history. I mean, just think about one fact that as we speak, thousands of conferences are unfolding uh, in the Baha'i world, 10,000 estimated total of conferences. Now, in the 10-year crusade, when Shoghi Effendi called for a series of five conferences to inaugurate the 10-year the crusade, you counted the participants as about four or 5,000. So today we have more conferences than we had participants at that time. And, and now we're counting participants in the millions, basically. And all of it is be, because of the work that Shoghi Effendi put in motion and that we were able to build on in a systematic way over 25 years. So that's what got us here. But now the question becomes, well, what lies ahead? What lies ahead is an even greater effort um, uh, perhaps you recall uh, that at the centenary of the Tablets of the Divine Plan, the House of Justice wrote two letters, one to the Baha'i world and one to the Baha'is of North America. And if you recall the content of that letter, the House of Justice was speaking to the, the spiritual mission of the, of the Baha'is of North America and, and the American Baha'i community. And um, it talked about the idea that, well, um, in the Tablets of the Divine Plan, Abdu'l-Baha 
uh, called upon the Baha'is of North America to undertake a world-embracing mission, that they had to carry the faith to all parts of the world and help raise up communities. And especially because of all the problems in the world, particularly World War II, which, uh, and, and opposition to the faith in Iran, which, which uh, uh, hobbled some of the other existing national communities, it was this citadel of faith in North America that then became a pillar for, for fulfilling its destiny to uh, carry the faith all over the world. And the House of Justice said in that centenary message that that first phase of, of this destiny was drawing to a close, that the faith now had been carried to all parts of the world. And the uh, American Baha'i community, the Baha'is in Canada, were standing shoulder to shoulder now with its sister communities all over the world who had been raised up and then could now take their own responsibility for the plan. But then the House of Justice reminded uh, the Baha'is of North America that Shoghi Effendi anticipated a still greater mission, uh, that, that the destiny wasn't complete. This is one chapter had been completed, and now a new chapter was opening up. Now what, what was that chapter? What is that chapter? That chapter is to usher in the world order of Baha'u'llah and a world civilization and a new race of human beings. So this uh, effort now to which you turn yourselves, of course there, this other chapter is not quite done. As you know in the nine year plan there are still international pioneering goals and so on. But this other still greater mission is the challenge of bringing the light of Baha'u'llah's teachings to bear on uh, the, the, the practices of the human race to transform uh, the individuals uh, and institutions and society to reflect this um, framework of divine justice that Baha'u'llah envisioned, which is fundamentally a framework of relationships. So the human race, uh, if we look uh, in the news, uh, unfortunately we see too many examples, heart-rending examples, of how the human race is profoundly disordered in its relationships. Sadly, uh, you know, what's captured our attention most recently in the headlines is another outbreak of war in Europe. And of course, you know, every day we read about that tragedy that, that um, is affecting so many people and so on. But then, of course, that's what the, the news is pointing us to. But then there's so many other uh, tragedies that are unfolding in the world, in different parts of the world, in, in our own country, where, uh, all right, well, our attention is distracted. We can't keep track of all of the ways in which these relationships are profoundly out of order. So it's kind of, um, we see that uh, uh, what Baha'u'llah described as a lamentably defective old world order. Uh, the set of relationships between individuals, communities, and institutions, which, you know, admittedly carried us to, to quite an advancement. If you go back in human history and you look at, you know, when we were in, uh, uh, you know, uh, clans or tribes and so on, oh, we know this, the story of how every revelation lifts humanity up, expands the circle of unity, and carries forward um, the advance of civilization. But the best that came before was the adolescent stage of the human race. There was still these divisions of us and them in various forms. And Baha'u'llah has now come to establish the maturity of the human race, a time when there's the oneness of humanity is uh, his primary call. But when we look around us, what we see is those old relationships are inadequate. They don't meet the need. And that's why people are trying to, uh, after two world wars, a cold war, war on terror, uh, economic dis uh, extremes of wealth and poverty and so on, in so many ways, uh, prejudices of various kinds, so many ways in which humanity has failed to organize itself, to respond to Baha'u'llah's call. Uh, then we see that uh, our reality is that we're profoundly 
uh, fragmented. If you look across the world, one thinker described it as moral tribes. Um, people divided, and they have different allegiances of religion or nationality or, or race or um, culture uh, or uh, just uh, uh, other ideologies that they've established and that they cling to, and they hold these ideas above the well-being of the human race. And so the result is uh, division into more and more groups of us and them. There's a number of different kind of strategies that, that people have used to try to think about what, uh, how to order the world and what to do about it and so on. So one is this division into these groups. And so if you belong to one of these groups, uh, well, there's a certain set of morals for us, certain way of behaving for us, but then we look at the other and we can treat that other in a different way, however you define that other. So that's one way. Another way is a kind of a profound relativism where uh, humanity uh, judges everything according to the individual's preference. So what's true, it doesn't matter what's true, it's what I believe is what's true. Or what I do is what's moral. Not, not that there's a morality out there that I have to bend myself to, to promote human well-being, or there's a truth out there that I have to find and I have to bend myself to. No, in this day and age, we bend these things to ourselves and everybody kind of can go their own way, everybody has their own truth and, and so on. But all of these different strategies, another one is to promote uh, like different kinds of ideology that emphasize, one of the things that Baha'u'llah tries to do is, and that we're working with in our plan, is to find the right kind of balance in relationships between individuals and groups and communities and institutions. But when we look at these relationships in the society, we see all of these three are kind of in opposition to one another. So in one part of the world, the individual is sacred and the individual's freedom is what matters and so on. And so there's a deep distrust of institutions and even doubt about whether there is such a thing as community and so on. And then in another part of the world, the, the institution is the primary thing that's emphasized. And so the state becomes the supreme thing and the individuals or, and even uh, the collective is suppressed in, in um, uh, serving the state. And, and then in other countries then it's the collective, the community that's emphasized and the individual isn't even free to kind of uh, express their own potentialities and so on. So there's all these different ways, all these different strategies, all these different ideologies at work and if it's, it's like the world is this you know, stained glass window with this beautiful image but now has been shattered and broken in the pieces and humanity's trying to figure out how to put those pieces back together but, but they don't fit and they don't work because the structures that came before were uh, for the uh, adolescent stage of the human race. And Abdu'l Baha has explained that, no, now we need new morals, new ways of thinking, new understanding. These pieces have to be put back in a set of new relationships. And um, so this then is what Baha'u'llah has come uh, to do and of course, the central teaching of Baha'u'llah is the oneness of hum humankind. And um, the central vehicle for uniting us is the word of God, which becomes the collective center, the creative word that conveys to us the sense of how these human relationships ought to be, who we are as human beings, how society ought to be arranged for, for justice to prevail. So not that society is arranged where some people are allowed to flourish and other people are objects that other people take advantage of to accumulate wealth or to accumulate power and so on. No, but what Baha the oneness of humanity uh, that Baha'u'llah proclaims calls for a set of relationships where justice requires that individuals communities and institutions, every individual, every people, and, and all the essential structures of society are given their due in the proper balance and relationship. And so our effort then becomes uh, to um, 
think about how do we go about creating that balance and harmony. We, we, we never had it before. When Baha'u'llah is teaching something that never existed, all throughout human history, there was this concept of us and them. And even religion had it, the believers and the infidels and so on. So it, it's almost like the human race couldn't create a circle of unity without somebody uh, to be opposed to. So for the first time in human history, Baha'u'llah says, there is no us and them anymore. There's only us. Abdu'l Baha says, when Baha'u'llah says, you're all the leaves of one tree, he has ended all differences. So we're one, we're one family. And, and he's uh, proclaiming that spiritual reality and now our challenge is to uh, pattern our behavior individually and collectively and through our institutions in a way that manifests that oneness, in, in the unity and diversity of, of the human race, where every people has a part to play in contributing to the building of this new world. But we've never had such a thing before, so we don't know how to do it. So the word of God conveys to us how to do it, but the challenge then becomes to learn how to translate what he said into reality and action. So um, here we can see that the, the ways that, it, within the teachings themselves, Baha'u'llah tells us not only the way things ought to be, what's true, what's good, what's right and wrong, but he also tells us how to get there. Uh, through uh, how do we build unity? How do people who maybe uh, human minds differ, Abdul Baha said. So it's natural, we're all going to think differently and so on. Well, how do people who fundamentally think differently learn how to get along and, and, and uh, think together and, and then um, act and solve problems and so on? So all of this is conveyed in Baha'u'llah's teaching. As we study the writings and we um, conform ourselves to an understanding of what Baha'u'llah said and, and try to bring our behavior into conformity with what he said, of course we all move closer together in unity. But then when we have differences on different things, well then he gives us the process of consultation. And then we can exchange views and so on. And, and again, it's very clear that consultation is a fundamentally different process. Abdul Baha explains it. We can't sacrifice some of those criteria, you know, that, oh, I just keep insisting on my point of view. He said, no, you have to listen to the views of others, and if you hear a better view than your own, you give it up, and so on. Well, well that's not the way society thinks and acts. Uh, generally speaking, people think if you argue, the truth comes out, whereas Abdul Baha said, if you argue, the truth remains hidden. So the exact opposite. So we have to learn how to trust and, uh, into this, in this practice that Baha'u'llah gives us and how to learn how to do it well. It's not like we're born learning how to consult. Well, now we have to learn how to do it and we have to take ourselves into account and try to do it better and better. But then, of course, when we consult, m maybe we reach consensus, the assembly reaches consensus, but maybe not. And then the majority opinion um, uh, is followed. But, but that's not the end of the process. Because then the idea is that then you put into practice that decision, even if you don't agree with it. Because if we all go together in unity, that's the fastest way we can test the effectiveness of that idea. And then if that idea doesn't prove to be effective, well then we can go back and reflect and revise our action and consult once more and then take a different approach, maybe one that was suggested before. But whereas the rest of society is left fighting, taking sides and fighting it out and insisting that you're right, well, the Baha'i writings say if two believers are discussing any of the divine questions, if they argue, they're both wrong. So, so it's not about having the right answer, it's about being able to work together because that's ultimately where these uh, solutions lie. So um, for the individual, what we're trying to do is promote the capacities of the individual, the respect human conscience, 
and uh, expand the freedom of the individual to live a good and moral and meaningful life and to use all these powers that God has given of mind and heart and will. Uh, every human being is a trust uh, of society and every human being has to have the chance to bring forth the expression, expression of these potentialities. The community has to be environment which on the one hand nurtures individuals and also becomes a protagonist for working for this framework of justice in the world. And then the institutions themselves have to accept responsibility. In many parts of the world, the institution, you, you go to the institution or government or whatever so that you can direct and tell other people what to do. But in the Baha'i system, the first thing they tell you if you're elected to a spiritual body is to forget your own likes and dislikes. You don't have a mandate to rule over people. You've been called to serve other people. And so you have to forget what you wanted to do and now look and see what the community needs and, and how you serve them. So this is a completely different arrangement of human affairs. And it's a profound change that we've never witnessed in human history. But then it's our job as Baha'is to learn how to do that. Today, we're better than we were 100 years ago at doing that, but we're not as good as we're gonna be 100 years from now. So we have to see ourselves as Baha'is, uh, whether we're individuals or community or institutions, we're in a continual process of moving toward what Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l Baha want for us. So every day we take ourselves into account Every day we read the writings and pray. And every day we try to be a better Baha'i in the afternoon than we were in the morning, and a better Baha'i tomorrow than we were today. And that's the process. But the community also has to go through such a learning process. Wherever we are now is, of course, not a perfect reflection of Baha'u'llah's teaching. So the community itself is engaged in patterns now where we gather, we reflect on our action, we see what's going well and see how we can expand it. We also see what's not going well and we see how we can revise and address that. And naturally the institutions then are nurturing that learning process. So how to find what's true, what's right and what's good is embedded in Baha'u'llah's teachings. And while the world has kind of lost its way, and that's what we see in the news and the headlines. People have lost the way to find what's true, what's right, what's good, and how to negotiate and work together to find those things without breaking into fragments and fighting. And even one group that agrees then starts fighting within itself and even become more extreme uh, in its ideas. Well, these ideas of Baha'u'llah have to replace those ideas. And what's most important, of course, is that we as Baha'is plant our feet firmly in Baha'u'llah's new system. And to the degree, of course, you know, we're not immune from the effects of society. Billions of dollars are spent uh, advertising, um, news, uh, social media. They all uh, pound ideas of the old world order upon us every single day. And our shield is that time we spend reading the writings and reflecting together or, or individually in our daily prayer. That's our shield. But if we succumb, if we just start parroting the same ideas as the wider society, if we post on social media the same thing everybody else is posting, if we uh, succumb to uh, the same kind of passions that are being stirred up in others, well then there, there's really no hope for us to kind of usher in this new set of relationships. So um, this brings me then to the discussion of the nine-year plan, because now the nine-year plan is the first of, a, of this, or, or this current stage of this series of plans that will take us uh, over the course of the next 25 years uh, in, into the third Baha'i century. So this third Baha'i century begins in 2044. Um, in um, 2046, this series of plans will end and so on. So, so after this experience of a century, we now turn our attention then to the next century, to the next 25 years, and then particularly to the next 
nine years that are framed in the plan. Um, so w the first question maybe is, w why is it a nine-year plan? You know, we've, we've had so many five-year plans in a row. Why, why suddenly is it nine years and so on? And um, part of this is mentioned in the letter by the House of Justice itself because it evokes the Guardian's uh, ten-year crusade um, and gives a sense of a, a more span of time and, and a historic dimension to, to the uh, time that we're, we're now entering. Um, in the Ten-Year Crusade, it was the kind of crowning point of the Guardian's ministry. And everything he taught us about how to have institutions, how to have plans, how to work together, uh, how to consult, how to um, uh, obey our institutions and w learn to work together and so on, all of those things then came together in the execution of the Ten-Year Crusade. And for the first time, all the national assemblies in the world could work together on a single plan. And more was accomplished in that 10 years because of the lessons learned from the guidance of Shoghi Effendi about how to translate the teachings into action. More was accomplished in that 10 years than was accomplished in more than a century of the previous history of the faith. More countries and territories were opened in the first year than were opened in 100 years. More, there were 12 national assemblies at the beginning of the 10 years. So 100 years to get 12 national assemblies. Then 54 national assemblies by the end of that 10 years. So this nine years is, represents the same kind of thing. What we've learned in the past 25 years, or even the past century, now comes to a historic moment where um, we have to put all that know-how into practice and see progress in the span of this nine years that we haven't witnessed uh, up to this point. So it, there's one element of, of course, taking the strongest clusters in the world and carrying them even further, like the most advanced clusters in the world. Uh, they've organized into patterns and reached out to people. Maybe they have 10, 20,000 people in the most advanced clusters in the world. Well, uh, by the end of the nine years, well, they have to go much further than that. Then the Hazard Justice also <laughs> observed, <coughs> excuse me, also observed that there's many countries that didn't make much progress uh, during the last period of time, that they got stuck uh, on different issues. So now um, the goal of the 25 years is to have a intensive program of growth in every cluster of the world. So obviously we can't leave anybody behind now. So then those stronger parts of the world have to, this is this opportunity for international pioneering, go to other places that, that have been held back. There's a specific goal uh, in, the, in the plan to have a third milestone cluster in every region of the world that can be a base for learning so further progress can be made and so on. But then, of course, uh, the other element that the House of Justice emphasized is this society-building power of the faith. Shoghi Effendi referred to that uh, many years ago, and um, at the time, the Baha'i faith was very small. So, you know, you, maybe you were sitting in a living room and there were nine people and so on, and then you would read this message from Shoghi Effendi talking about the society building power of the faith, and, and you look around the room and you say, really? <laughs> Us? <laughs> of course, we know we have total faith in what Baha'u'llah said, that the manifestation of God comes and sets in motion the transformation of civilization. But sitting in that room so many years ago, you could scarcely imagine, how does that work? Well, now the House of Justice says, well, we've already begun to see that in the most advanced clusters in the world where there, we have this uh, um, kind of coherence between the work of individuals, communities, and institutions and engaged not in a process of community building, but also in a process of addressing the material needs of humanity through social action and also participating in the discourses of society, that what we're beginning to see in these most advanced places 
is, is the beginnings of, of a profound change. The impact of Baha'u'llah's revelation on rearranging these relationships in such a way that we see a manifest change among the people. So in, in places where villages, everybody's participating in the core activities, or in regions where there's a significant number of, um, of um, Baha'is participating, maybe uh, like that video a few years back about uh, the junior youth program in the schools of Kiribati and so on, which were not only transforming the schools, but had community leaders remarking on the fact that you know, fewer people were going to prison and so on. So what we're seeing is the impact of these activities in a profound social transformation in people. So the people in the village, in one account that was given, the people in the village see themselves as one family. And whereas before they were kind of divided, they had problems, they went to the village leader and, and, and tried to sort out all these problems. Well, now they, they saw themselves completely differently as one family. Those problems went away. People began to trust each other and they began to work for the betterment. They would cook together, they would gather together, they would see themselves as one family. Uh, local spiritual assemblies were being recognized in many places uh, for their moral leadership. Um, and people were turning, e e even local leaders were encouraging people to turn to local assemblies um, to sort out their problems because the Baha'is would uh, render a just uh, outcome and decision and so on. And um, village chiefs, a network of village chiefs in some regions are being worked with to, to build their capacity to be able to help to create a movement of unity, uh, not only in different villages, but throughout the region. So these are just beginnings of glimmerings, but this society building power is being felt. Um, you remember, for example, um, this report from uh, India and uh, in one of the videos where because of the engagement in the pattern of activity, the caste system was losing its power over the people. It wasn't because there was a course on the caste system. It was because there was a course on how do you translate what Baha'u'llah said into reality and action. And so as people learn to do that, and as they learn the daily practice of reading the writings, prayer, taking themselves into account, changing themselves, and changing their relationship with others, well, then those um, powerful uh, forces in society that tied their hands before just fell away because they learned how to uh, live together in a new pattern of action and so on. And uh, it, it also related the idea of whereas girls uh, were, their education was stopped and they were forced into early marriage and they just moved into the home of their mother-in-law and so on. Well, no, now um, parents were postponing uh, marriage and having their girls complete their education and, and even in some cases allowing their daughters to, to choose you know, their own spouses and things like that. So these are profound changes what we see as you start to create this power of a different set of relationships. It's like, uh, you know, the difference between a rock and a magnet. It, it's both mineral, but one is arranged in a way where it has a power to affect reality around it. And so as Baha'is are learning how to change this set of relationships among ourselves and to reach out and pull others, it creates a, a change in dynamic. And that's the society building power that's just beginning to glimmer, and that's the society building power that we have to release, learn how to release in every greater measure over the next 25 years. Now, um, the House of Justice, I mean, there's so many elements, I, I can't cover all the elements that are in the nine-year plan, but one of the points I wanna remark on is um, where the House of Justice talks about this generational challenge. You know, if, if for example, you look um, that over a 25 year period, well, that means that if you're starting a children's class today, that five year old is going to be 30 years old by the end of this series of plans. And this junior youth who's 12 will be 37. And this youth will be 40. 
uh, this 15-year-old youth will be 40 years old. So what, we're, what we have to be conscious of is the processes that we're engaged in, which are not just these activities, but also the educational process that we're engaged in to build the capacity of people to translate Baha'u'llah's revelation into reality and action. And so we have a responsibility to create systems so these young people are educated and they become a different kind of person. Somebody who is adept at understanding what Baha'u'llah said, putting it into practice. And we see many stories kind of emerging across the country and across the world of how these young people who are pulled into these programs are touched and it changes their whole perception uh, of reality and so on. And so we have a responsibility then to help them navigate these stages, this childhood, this period of junior youth, this period of youth, to, to go and get a higher education or a vocation so that they can establish themselves with a job and create a family and basically in that family become a building block of, of a new kind of society and so on. And this is, we have to keep in mind that um, generational challenge so that at the end of this period, we've raised up the people who can bring forth the society building power to a, a degree that we've never been witnessed before. Now, the question is, how do you do this? I mean, it's easy to talk about. It's maybe even easy to write a plan about it, but it's a lot harder to do it. So, so what is the House of Justice really asking us to do? I think fundamentally that what we have to keep in mind is that the whole heart and soul of what the House of Justice has been asking is, is about learning. You know, it, it's not like um, a group of Baha'is somewhere is sitting in a cluster and they know how to organize affairs to have 50,000 people engaged in activity and social action that begins to change the material life of people and profound discourse that changes the course of thinking uh, in a society. But then there's Baha'i say, well, no, I don't, I don't feel like it. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I mean, if we're not doing it, it's because we don't know how to do it. And then we have to learn how to do something we don't know how to do. If there's anything that we see in our cluster that doesn't measure up to a Baha'i standard, it's not because we, we want to do it wrong. It's just that we don't know how to do it right, you know. So, so the whole framework of the plan is built around this idea of learning and around the idea of capacity, building capacities that we didn't have before, not only in ourselves, but in the widest circle of people that we can embrace. Um, I'll give you an example. When I, uh, before I became a Baha'i, um, I, I was an atheist, and uh, some friends of mine invited me to a Baha'i conference at Green Lake uh, in Wisconsin. And it was toward the end of the first five-year plan, not, not any of those other five-year plans, but that first one way back in the 70s. And um, William Sears was the speaker. And it was near the end of the plan, and uh, the hand of the cause was speaking about the importance of teaching the faith. And so I was listening, and you know, he, 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 his, he, his powerful appeal uh, made me think, yes, I can teach this religion. And then I thought, no, wait a minute, I'm an atheist, I, I can't do that. <laughs> so then, um, that talk about you know, raising up the rocks, basically, that, that was William Sears' speech. But you know, he, my heart was attracted, I soon became a Baha'i after that, and then I knew the importance of teaching, but I didn't know how to teach the Baha'i faith, and I said, no, I have to learn how to do this. So how, how do you learn? Well, I, I looked at what other people were doing. I tried to follow their example. Mostly it was about learning by doing. So first I would think, oh, I don't know what to say. And then I would read some books and so on. And then I would concentrate on saying the right thing to such a degree that I, I wasn't even thinking about what the person thought about what I was saying. So I was just trying to say it right. And so I'd do it once, twice, 50 times. 
And then it was like, oh, I wonder what this pe person thinks about what I'm saying, and so on. So then, all right, I'll ask them, what do you think, and so on. And then I learned, all right, now you have to listen, and, and you have to then uh, frame what you're saying based on the interest of the, of the seeker, and so on. And sometimes they would ask me a question, and I didn't know the answer to the question. Then I would have to go study. Then I would come back. Then I would present them with the answer. Then, then they would like the answer. Then I thought, okay, now I really know how to teach. Then the next person would ask me the same question, and then I would give them my answer. And they didn't like that answer and so on. So then I had to learn that, oh, well, uh, you know, different people think differently. And then you have to learn how to adapt your approach to the different person. But it was all learning by doing. But I didn't know. And then I tried. And then I learned. And, well, God will be the judge of how good I got at it and so on. But I, and I can always get better. But I get better by doing more. Not, there, there's no other way. So ultimately then, that's, that's really what we're doing. In every aspect of what we're doing, it's about learning. It's not about, there, there's one extreme and there's another extreme. One extreme is we try to turn what we're doing into a formula, like a recipe. That was what I was doing with teaching, like say this, say that, say this other thing, and so on. The other thing is we say, well, everything goes. Everybody do whatever you like to do, and so on. But whether we go to this extreme or that extreme, what happens is our pattern of systematic action falls apart. So we're looking for something in the middle, but we have to learn what that thing in the middle is. And every aspect of what we're doing has to be learned. Another example, um, look at the junior youth program, for example. Well, um, that program grew out of the efforts of the Office of Social and Economic Development. But what we started with was a literacy program. And we had a number of pilot projects for literacy, and one was for adults, and one had this pattern of activity, one was aimed at young people, and junior youth age, and so on. And that junior youth one proved to be effective. So then out of that, that was more effective than the other one, so we said, well, all right, well, let's create a program uh, to raise up junior youth on the power of the word. And, and really, we, at the time, we didn't even have the term junior youth and so on. So every facet of that program had to be developed from nothing. So what do you say to the junior youth? What do you say to somebody that they would want to be an animator? What do you say to the parent that will allow them to send their junior youth to your program? When the junior youth comes and they just want to play soccer and you want them to study a book, well, how do you uh, navigate that? And, and actually, where did that book come from anyway? Uh, what, where, now we have some dozen books and maybe a dozen more that we'll create, but every one of those books had to come from an experience. You're doing something with junior youth, it proves to be effective, you write it into a book, somebody else can apply it. So over 15, somewhere between 15 and 20 years, we learned every facet of this program from nothing. Now, when you look around the world, well, we have hundreds of thousands of junior youth in this program. We have a global network of, uh, of uh, offices and sites that are designed to train animators and to spread the program and so on. And like I said, the power of this program has become so great that it has transformed schools and even communities through the power of the word that is changing the way these young people think about themselves. Not only does it give them the material power of reading and expressing themselves in ways that they couldn't do before, but it also teaches them Baha'u'llah's spiritual principles about what's true and what's right and what's good and how to arrange relationships. So each of those two youth become protagonists of that. And when parents see it, they want that. And they want that, and the village next door sees that, and they want that for their village, and so on. So every facet of that has been learned. And so wherever your cluster is, or any other cluster, you have to, this is the whole point of uh, reflection meaning. You have to sit down at a certain point and say, this is what we learned how to do. Let's do more of it. This is what we haven't quite figured out yet. So. Let's do some things to figure that piece out. 
So say, take a devotional meeting, for example. Well, one way uh, that the friends in different parts of the world have started is to just organize a family devotional. But what about the idea of the devotional meeting as a portal to attract people into the faith? So it's not enough to just sit in your home and say prayers. No, I have to learn how to invite people. So maybe I don't know how to invite people. So how do I learn? Well, look around. Maybe somebody does know how to invite people. They can help me. Or I learn by doing. I try. I try this way. Nobody wants to come. I try that way. People like to come. Then they come, and they don't come back. So then I have to think, oh, OK, well, maybe I should organize my program differently. So not only do they come, but they'll also come back. And then it's not just that people come, and they pray, and they get spiritual meaning out of it, but I also have to connect them to other things. They're on a spiritual journey. For some people, they just want to come and pray, and that's wonderful. But for others, now I have the chance to connect them to other things, to a fireside, to a study circle, to a children's class, to a junior youth group, so that then they become, uh, there's a path for them to also become protagonists of the process as well. But every step of that has to be learned. What's the state of the art of devotional meetings in, in this cluster? Or what's the state of the art of devotional meetings around the country and so on? Well, we have to look at the best practice, we have to learn from it, and we have to figure out how to make it work where we live. Teaching is another element of that. I told you my struggles in learning how to teach, but if nobody is becoming a Baha'i in our community, or it's very few, well, then that's an area of learning. We, we like the House of Justice said, we have people, they're involved in activity, they're standing at the threshold. Well, what's the conversation you have with people that invites them to cross the thresholds. Again, if we don't have that in our cluster, we need to figure out how to do it. And if we do have it, then we learn how to raise up more capacity in people, in more people, to be able to do the same thing. Um, another facet is this idea of a coherent life of service that the House of Justice talked about. You know, basically, the way society is organized is not to make you coherent. It's to fragment. And again, this is, this is good for the economic situation that we have and so on. So people see that, well, there's my life at home and there's my life at work and then there's my family and then there's this. And it's hard to put all the pieces together. Well, for a Baha'i, our challenge is to figure out precisely how to do that. Now, all of those are facets of our life. But in each one of those facets, we, we can't separate like my work life from my Baha'i life. No, also I have to figure out what insights can I draw from Baha'u'llah's teachings to bring into my professional life and so on. Maybe there's a limit in how far that can go, uh, uh, but, but then what, what is it? If I'm a businessman, I run my business differently than, than other people. If I'm a teacher in a school, I teach my class differently. If I'm the principal, I organize my teachers in a different way and so on. This again is, is all part of, of what we're learning how to do. Uh, one of the, I think, most significant challenges uh, in the United States is this question of learning how to create a society that reflects interracial fellowship. Shoghi Effendi, in the advent of divine justice, which was written when the first plan was established, the first seven-year plan, said, look, you're too small right now to have an impact on your society. And he said that, um, uh, so just focus on yourself. But not only did he give an analysis of Abdu Baha's principles and, and how we have to kind of understand our responsibility, but then he basically gave the mandate and said, Look, put this into practice in your personal life, in your family, in your assembly, in your summer school, in, in every space Baha'is inhabited. They had the responsibility to, even though it was a small space, make that space reflect a, a genuine interracial fellowship which followed the example of Abdu Baha. Now, then that created a very practical thing. Does my home reflect that or not? If not, 
I'd better do something about it. Otherwise, how will my children grow up to be a protagonist of this process? So that was one mandate at that time. We're too small. But he said, you have to do this to prepare yourself for the time when you're called upon to eliminate this problem from society as a whole. Well, friends, what I told you about that um, uh, centenary of the divine plan uh, uh, letter from the House of Justice, this transition from one phase of your mission to the next phase of your mission, well, this is that time then. Then, then you have to figure out uh, how then, if we're going to engage in the society building power, how do we begin a process to eliminate this problem from society? Now, it, it's not a process of fighting race, racial prejudice. It's like you don't eliminate the darkness by fighting the darkness. You eliminate the darkness by turning on the light. So the question becomes, how do you reorganize these relationships among people to create a beacon of light that reflects this interracial fellowship? We should have been working on it all this time. And we did, sometimes we did, sometimes we didn't, and so on. But now, go do it for the whole society, not just for the white community. How do you do it? I don't know. It's not like we're sitting in this room and we know, but we just don't want to do it. We don't know. It's clearly, the society doesn't know. As a matter of fact, not only does the society not know, but from everything I read in the headlines, they're going rapidly backwards. So, so they're, they're rapidly learning how to undo all the progress that was done before. So our job is to figure this out. But again, we don't know how to do it. So we have to sit down, just like the junior youth program, just like learning how to make a devotional meeting a portal, just like learning how to teach the faith. We have to learn something that is not known, that, that, that we don't know and the society doesn't know. And so we have to set in motion acts in our community building, in our projects for social action, in our involvement in discourse, and start learning. And that process is already underway, but it has to become more systematic. It can't just be an activity here and an activity there. We have to have reflection on action. We have to learn. And again, what I'm saying about this is also true about every other uh, facet of uh, applying Baha'u'llah's teaching over time. We've gone from that uh, mission, particularly characterized in the Tenure Crusade, of carrying the faith all over the world, to now this mission in the nine-year plan to learn how to release the society building power on an unprecedented level in our clusters all over America. That's the only way we can learn to discharge our responsibilities um, that we've been given. Now, friends, uh, I, I want to conclude. I mean, when we look ahead, I think one of the things, um, at least I know, I, I would say that what we learned over the past 25 years, that it's hard to look into the future. It, it, it's really, even with a five-year plan, to visualize how it's going to come out uh, it proved to be impossible. We, we kept uh, aiming at something, it would come out differently, sometimes much further than we anticipated. Sometimes we ran into obstacles and challenges and so on. But you see, for example, the whole idea of a program of growth. Uh, when in the four-year plan, there was no idea of that. It emerged in the one-year plan when there were some experiments in some places. And then when the first five-year plan began, the House of Justice couldn't even describe what it was. It said, look, here's some prerequisites. Uh, you need a group of people ready to take on the challenge of growth. You need a strong assembly and so on. So there are a few prerequisites. Then it said, now go figure it out, basically. And, and the Baha'i world went out, and the teaching center went out. And, and then in the, in the few years of that plan, a pattern came out. It, it began in Boaku. I remember when one of the members of the teaching center came back, shared the news, we, we consulted about it. And then we all went out, and then we tried to create this pattern in other countries and so on. And so then, finally, a pattern took root that, that the House of Justice was able to speak about in the second five-year plan. 
And it said, oh, okay, there's a cycle of activities, and it has a reflection phase, and an intensive teaching phase, and a consolidation phase, and so on. And then these cycles follow one another, and we continue to act and reflect and improve our efforts over time. And then um, the House of Justice was then able to call for 1,500 of, of these intensive programs of growth. And then uh, when the next five-year plan came, then it said, okay, you had one way of thinking about this. Now we have a different way of thinking about it. We're going to have some milestones and so on. And the House of Justice described two milestones. And so on. Then at the end of that five-year plan, then there was a frontier where we had a third milestone, and then that was described and so on. So each element of it, it wasn't like you could sit back in 1996 and describe this whole thing. Otherwise, the House of Justice could have saved us a lot of time. And if it just wrote the, uh, five -year, the last five-year plan in the first four years, it, it would have saved us a lot of trouble. And so on. But, but the point is you, that's not how it works. It doesn't work that way. The House of Justice gives us direction. Then we have to learn how to do it. And then the House of Justice can share what, what we learned how to do, and then we can go through the next stage and so on. So now we turn to this chapter, um, that, that, that destiny of America that was connected to the, the um, ten-year crusade. Now the next chapter of this is now the nine-year plan when we have to learn how to release the society building power. Now I want to share with you um, you, you know, there was one example, I don't know if you saw, but when, when this uh, war broke out in Ukraine, some of the friends wrote to us, and we wrote back to one of the friends. They were saying, oh, this is terrible, what can we do, and so on. And one of the things the House Justice wrote was, well, well the Baha'is did respond. Uh, the National Assembly, again, to the uh, degree that it could operate under very chaotic circumstances, was in contact with the friends, trying to help them, trying to um, give them what they needed to also help the others around them and so on. Sometimes that meant one thing, sometimes it meant another. In some cases it meant maybe adopting some orphans and things like that. Uh, the Baha'is outside um, the country responded by helping refugees and so on. And uh, some Baha'is who were doctors or had other NGOs uh, went to the region to offer their assistance and so on. But then, ultimately then, you know, if you look in the scale of things, well, maybe these are very small things. But the point is that within the space the Baha'is inhabited, they put the teachings into practice. The problem was not the Baha'i response. The problem was the spaces were too small. So we have to, this thing that the Guardian put in motion and the Tablets of Divine Plan, beginning with our little summer school and our family and so on, now we have to learn how to expand that. We've learned how to expand it to the level of neighborhoods and villages, but it still has to get bigger in social action, in community building, in involvement in discourses of society. We have to expand the spaces where the light of Baha'u'llah's teachings are shining and where this new set of relationships can be conveyed to humanity and they can respond to it. So that's the challenge that we face, this expansion of spaces. Now, I, I just want to leave you uh, with one um, quotation from The Guardian. This was written in Baha'i administration, uh, so almost 100 years ago, really at the beginning of his ministry. He said, the plight of mankind, the condition and circumstances under which we live and labor are truly disheartening, and the darkness of prejudice and ill will enough to chill the stoutest heart. Disillusion and dismay are invading the hearts of peoples and nations, and the hope and vision of a united and regenerated humanity is growing dimmer and dimmer every day. Passions supposed to have been curbed and subdued are now burning fiercer than ever before. And the voice of peace and goodwill seems drowned amid the unceasing convulsions and turmoil. What, let us ask ourselves, should be our attitude as we stand under the all-seeing eye of our vigilant master, our vigilant master, 
gazing at a sad spectacle so utterly remote from the spirit which he breathed into the world. Are we to follow in the wake of the wayward and the despairing? Are we to allow our vision of so unique, so enduring, so precious a cause to be clouded by the stain and dust of worldly happenings, which no matter how glittering and far-reaching in their immediate effects, are but the fleeting shadows of an imperfect world? Are we to be carried away by the flood of hollow and conflicting ideas, or are we to stand unsubdued and unblemished upon the everlasting rock of God's instructions? He said, I'm not prepared to state that the plan agrees in principle or in method with the prevailing notions now uppermost in men's minds, nor that it should conform with those imperfect, precarious, and expedient measures feverishly resorted to by an agitated humanity. Are we to doubt that the ways of God are not necessarily the ways of man? Is not faith but another word for implicit obedience, wholehearted allegiance, uncompromising adherence to that which we believe is the revealed and expressed will of God, however perplexing it might first appear, however at variance with the shadowy views, the impotent doctrines, the crude theories, the idle imaginings, the fashionable conceptions of a transient and troublous age. If we are to falter or hesitate, if our love for him should fail to direct us and keep us within his path, if we desert divine and emphatic principles, what hope can we any more cherish for healing the ills and sicknesses of this world. So friends, we have the guidance we need. In that letter the House of Justice wrote on the centenary of the plan, it said that it hopes that the friends can now see the straight line, the straight path from the initial guidance of the guardian all the way up to the guidance that the House of Justice has given us today to put Baha'u'llah's teachings into action to transform the society around us. And when we look around us and we see the process of the disintegration of the old world order accelerating, we have to keep in mind that what the Guardian told us is that we have to forge ahead into the future, serenely confident that the hour of our mightiest exertions and the supreme opportunity for our greatest exploits must coincide with the upheaval marking the lowest ebbs in mankind's fast declining fortunes. So this, friends, is the work of the nine-year plan. This is the work of the next 25 years, the generational challenge that lies before us. And the House of Justice has full confidence that the friends will arise to meet that challenge. Thank you very much. <laughs>